right. So Dr. Annette Joseph Gabriel is an assistant professor of French and Francophone studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Annette is a scholar working at the intersection of French and Afro diasporic culture, literature, and politics. She conducts research and teaches courses on race, gender, and citizenship in France, the Caribbean, and Africa. Her areas of expertise include Black women's writings, anti colonial activism, and slavery in the French Atlantic. So Annette is going to speak to us for about 15 to 20 minutes. We will have a quick discussion and then invite you into the conversation through the Q&A function that we have available on Zoom. I also just wanted to take this opportunity to give a quick shout out to my friend, Dr. Yolande Booker, who really planted the seed in my mind last year around the possibilities or the sending out signals to the world in terms of the kinds of partnerships and collaborations that we can build as black uh, academics uh, located in different parts of the world, including on the African continent. So this, this invitation today and this discussion is really a much, uh, as much uh, a testament to the idea that your land planted uh, in my head as it is to the, the work that we need to be doing consistently to connect with each other as black feminist women academics who are located in different parts of the world around our scholarship and to be, build greater solidarity in the work that we do. So Annette, let me turn over to you. Okay, thank you so much, um, we know for, for the invitation to, to be part of this conversation. Um, and I'm also so grateful to everyone who, who has kind of tuned in. Um, I'm grateful to you for your time and your engagement um, in joining us from near and far. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my slide. Um, so if you bear with me just for one second, um, ideally you should be seeing now my slide. All right, so um, again, I, I just wanna uh, to, to echo the kind of the, the shout out to, to Yolande. I wanna thank you again, we know for, for creating this space for conversation. Um, I'm not gonna speak for very long because I'm really eager to get into conversation and exchange with everyone. Um, so I, I want to begin with a provocation. Citizenship is a fiction. By this, I do not mean that citizenship is a lie or that it is not real or any other connotations that the word fiction might carry for you. What I mean is that citizenship is a set of stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and where and how we belong. And these stories include the laws and policies around entry and exit across borders, um, around policing and surveillance within borders. But these stories also include the myths, the narratives that we weave about the intangible ties that bind us to our communities on multiple scales. So if you think about, you know, kind of go back in the day, Barrington Anderson talking about the nation as an imagined community, um, right? That to think about citizenship as a fiction is to think about the multiple scales, right? At which people sort of imagine and construct communities, um, both within, but also beyond, but also sometimes in conflict with the national scale. And so focusing more specifically on the French context, um, I, I want to take as my starting point, one of the stories that France tells itself about what it means to be French. And so every time I give a talk, I kind of joke that I really wish that France would stop giving me material to my talk, right? Like, let me just come and sit here and talk about my poetry. Uh, but you know, here we are. So this is an article that appeared in the New York Times um, two days ago, I believe, what is pandemic time, right? But two days ago, I think. Um, and the, the title of, of the, the article is, Will American Ideas Tear France Apart? Some of its leaders think so. Um, and so if you go down towards the bottom of the page beyond the, the image there, right? The opening is really quite dramatic, right? Paris, first of all, where we locate France, right? The geography of France is Paris. The threat is said to be existential. It fuels secessionism, gnaws at national unity, abets Islamism, attacks France's intellectual and cultural heritage. The threat? Certain social science theories entirely imported from the United States, said President Emmanuel Macron. French politicians, high profile intellectuals and journalists are warning that progressive American ideas, specifically on race, gender, post-colonialism, are undermining their society. This is one of those fictions. In this story, racism has a nationality and that nationality is American. It is decidedly not French. 
And so to acknowledge the existence of the inequalities, the discrimination and the violence that are baked into the very fabric of French politics, society and everyday life is to import an American linguistic and conceptual framework. At least so the story goes. In one sense, and in one sense only, this is actually true. That one sense is this, to speak about racism in France, particularly as a black French person, is to betray that national fiction, that the disappearance of race is the disappearance of racism. And so in response to this New York Times uh, piece, scholars and public commentators over the last couple of days have offered up the long and damning catalog of France's racial sins as evidence that the very idea of Frenchness developed, was developed through um, and shaped by the country's slaveholding past and colonial history. So lots of examples, right, have kind of, have kind of popped up as, as evidence of Francis' racial sins, right? So from Francis' creation of the detestable Code Noir, right, the Black Code that inscribed the brutality of slavery in law, um, you know, to 20th century, the massacre of Tiraya Senegalais, um, you know, colonial African troops that had risked their lives in the liberation of France during World War II, only to be shot and killed on the colonial administration's orders when they demanded the pensions they were owed, to even more forward in time to our contemporary moment to today, right? The alarming statistic by Defenseur de Droit that people of Black and Arab descent in France today are 20 times more likely to be stopped by police, right? So the long litany of Black people suffering, killed, destroyed, certainly belies the national fiction of French citizenship as guaranteeing liberty, equality, and fraternity. And providing that long litany is one, is one way to go, right? That accounting is one way to go. But the thing about fiction is that it offers opportunities to think creatively, both in the sense of constructing new narratives of belonging and creatively in the sense of creation, that is making those new narratives life-giving rather than death-dealing. So here's what I mean. When France says that the study, analysis, and critique of racism is an American importation, it erases the current activism by Black women like Asa Traoré, whose years-long fight for justice for the killing of her brother, Adama Traoré, at the hands of police is ongoing. And it also erases the long history of Black French intellectuals who have thought and written about racism in France in ways that are not routed through or imported from the United States. They may be in conversation, certainly, right? But they're not indebted in that way. It enacts, to my mind, an almost discursive killing that disappears these intellectuals and, their, and the victims of, of French violence, colonial and state violence that they write about. It disappears the evidence of their lives and the work that they did in pushing France closer to its own ideals of liberty, equality, fraternity. So what I try to do in my book, Reimagining Liberation, is to attend to the lives and work of Black French women or Black women in the French empire more broadly, who engage in creative fictions of their own through their anti-colonial activism and literary and cultural production as they sought to redefine citizenship as various forms of community, right? So community to be questioned, challenged, unraveled, reconstituted, and brought into being on their own terms. So in this book, I study seven women, and you can see sort of photographs of them on your screen. Um, seven women from Africa, the Caribbean, South America, so French Guyana, um, and the United States. Um, to think about how they try to reimagine what it meant to be a Black woman and a French citizen as forms of belonging that did not necessarily have to be at odds. And so think kind of more concretely, right, they, they sort of did this in three key ways. 
first they did this by directly challenging French state constructions of what it meant to be French. And I like to think about like the, the, the sarcastic chuckle that many of them would probably admit to read Emmanuel Macron's words about you know, racism being sort of an, an American import, right? But the, the, the thing that's interesting is that it's, it's not so much the way that Frenchness is constructed as who is doing that construction. That is something that they're challenging, right? So they're challenging the French state constructions of what it means to be French. And so in a lot of their work, they understand that Frenchness had to go beyond the borders of France. So thinking geographically and had to go conceptually beyond citizenship, right? As solely one's relationship to the nation state. And so for example, Suzanne Césaire from Martinique who saw in poetry and in literary expression, the possibility for imagining a pan-Caribbean civilization. The second way um, was to think about or, or to engage in transnational exchange through travel, correspondence, and activism. And one of the women who really stands out for this is Aslanda Robson, um, who is often sort of kind of subsumed under the legacy of her more famous husband, Paul Robson, um, but you know, who was an intellectual activist um, and, and performer in some ways in her own right, right? But Aslanda Robson occupied kind of insider and outsider positions as she navigated solidarity with black women in the French empire from, from her own fraught position as an African-American woman whose citizenship was suspended when the US government confiscated her passports for communist activity. And then the third key way was enfranchising Black women as voters and as political representatives. And in the book, there are two women who really stand out for this, Paulette Nardal from and working in Martinique and Awa Keita from and working in then French Sudan, today Mali. Um, they were working in two very different frameworks. Paulette Nardal in um, what was at the time a newly minted overseas department of France, right, Martinique, um, and Awakata in what was still effectively a colony, right, French Sudan at the time as a French colony. Um, and so because, the, because of the ways that those frameworks continue to tether their home and their home spaces to France, they understood the framework um, or, or the space of electoral politics to be limited in the possibilities that it could offer. And yet they did not simply wash their hands off electoral politics and say, well, we're gonna go off and do something more radical or more suitably radical, right? That they refused to cede ground even in electoral politics despite its limits. And so both of them engaged in sort of like mass efforts to register women um, as voters um, in order to have them also be able to uh, kind of assert their political will and their voice in elections. Um, the interesting thing about French citizenship, right, that promise of French citizenship as guaranteeing always more kind of democratic or more equitable access to, um, to political representation was again, one of those fictions because for Awakita working in French Sudan, today Mali, she at the time, because of her class position um, as an educated woman, as a midwife, was uh, classified as a French citizen, but she renounced that citizenship because it did not actually offer her the benefits that she needed, right? So she denounced that French citizenship because it prevented her from voting in local elections and therefore severed her from the local community that she found to be a more promising space, right? So when we think about the limits of uh, electoral politics, the work of these women um, not only refused to cede ground, but also tried to imbue those limited spaces, um, right? With increased possibilities, right? So hence the sort of the, the title re imagining. Um, and so, you know, th th these were the, the three main ways that I, I, I sort of touch on in the book as I work through the lives and the, the stories of these seven women. Um, you know, like, like I said, I, I won't speak very long today because I'm very eager to get into our conversation. Um, so I, I want to close by, by reading and reflecting on a, a brief passage from the book, right, the very first page as a way to kind of tie together all of these ideas of what it means to think about citizenship, um, its limits and its promises in ways that challenge the idea of Frenchness, but also in ways that um, sort of expand possibilities for political activism and solidarity in Africa um, and, and in, the, in the African diaspora. And so essentially the book begins like this. In August, 1944, as General Philippe Leclerc marched into Paris 
to liberate the city from German occupation. André Blouin marched into the mayor's office in Bangui, a French territory in Central Africa, to obtain a quinine card for the malaria treatment that would save her two-year-old son, René. Quinine cards were for Europeans only, and the mayor let the distraught woman know this in no uncertain terms. As the daughter of an African mother and a European father, Blouin was classified by colonial law as Métis or mixed race, a status that extended to her son. Colonial guards dragged her out of the mayor's office as she screamed, I am a French citizen, the same as you, and so is my son. Yours is an accursed race, cursed authors of a murderous law." End quote. In her autobiography, Blua maintains that the events of World War II and her son's death in a seemingly far-flung outpost of the French Empire in Africa were inextricably linked. She writes, and I quote, I have been asked, why would white people be so cruel to a child who was three-fourths white? My answer is, this was deepest equatorial Africa, and the war was on, end quote. The institutionalized racism that viewed people in the colonies as dispensable bodies on the battlefields of Europe was also at work in the murderous law that reserved anti-malaria treatment for white Europeans only. René's preventable death from malaria galvanized Blouin into political action. She first fought the Quinine Law and obtained a reform, making the anti-malaria treatment more accessible. From there, her activism became more explicitly anti-colonial and took on a regional and then international scale. She worked as an advisor to Sekouture and Kwame Nkrumah, the first presidents of Guinea and Ghana respectively, and eventually became chief of protocol in the cabinet of Congolese prime minister, Patrice Lumumba. Blouin's experiences of exclusion and discrimination as an African woman in colonized territory propelled her to advocate for a more expansive form of citizenship beyond France's exclusionary race-based tiered citizenship policies. After losing her son, it became even more urgent to work toward a decolonized world. So I wanna take a step back, right? I, I begin the book this way because among other things, I wanted to think about what the Martinican poet Aimé Césaire meant when he wrote, and I quote, and above all, my body as well as my soul, beware of crossing your arms in the sterile attitude of a spectator, for life is not a spectacle. A sea of miseries is not a proscenium. A man who screams is not a dancing bear. Blouin's screams were not an, a spectacle to be observed, to be written about dispassionately, and then to be read from the safety of the mediating pages of an academic monograph. They are a form of witnessing, witnessing the ways that the fiction of citizenship marked her body through racial classification, foreclosed her motherhood by killing her son, and galvanized her pan-Africanist work as a self-described, quote, African nationalist, whose vision for citizenship exceeded the narrow framing of racialized French citizenship, much as her own screams exceeded the constricting bounds of the colonial administrator's office that painful day when he condemned her child to die. There is probably you know, so much more that we can say about all of this, right? We can talk about motherhood. We can talk about the geographies that Black women wove together in their work. Um, I'm thinking about you know, Awino's own work on global Blackness and transnational solidarities then and now. Um, you know, so there, there's so much that we can touch on and I'm, I'm very eager to, to be in conversation with you all today. So thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to our discussion. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Annette. So there's a request before I go into my, my sets of questions. There's a request in the chat for you to invoke the names of the seven women on, on, uh, that your book is anchored around. Yes, that is such such a crucial request and an unpardonable oversight on my part. Um, so I put them back up on your screen, right? I went the route of images, um, but I so kind of looking. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but you know. So we I, I begin with Suzanne Cesaire, right? So um, I, I talked a little bit about Amy Cesaire, the Martinican poet. Again, Suzanne, like many of the other women here, is sort of subsumed under the legacy of her more famous husband. Um, but Suzanne Cesaire in Martinique was a, a writer and intellectual, um, and I think about her work in Martinique in conversation with what's happening in Haiti, um, particularly because of her travel to Haiti. And so Suzanne Tezel in the book is going to articulate a sort of a pan-Caribbean civilization in similar ways to how André Blouin understands pan-Africanism. Um, next to Suzanne Cézère, you have Paulette Nardal, who has a distinction, among many other things, certainly, of being one of the first casualties of World War II um, when a ship on which she was traveling was bombarded by German torpedoes, or was, uh, yeah, by German torpedoes, um, and she was gravely injured. And so then the, the rest of her work when she returns to Martinique after this traumatic incident is going to really think carefully about how to navigate, right, the relationship between the Caribbean and French citizenship, right, as kind of political and cultural locations, specifically because when she came back home with those war injuries, the French state, despite her French citizenship, denied her disability benefits, right? So again, that fiction of citizenship. Um, so then next to Paulette Nardal, we have um, Eugenie Ebuetel. I write about Eugenie Ebuetel and next to her Jeanne Vial together in one chapter to think about how we might bridge um, you know, uh, uh, the life of a woman from French Guyana with that of the life of André Blouin, um, a woman from uh, French Central Africa, and the work that they both did in the French resistance during World War II. Uh, Jeanne Vial, in particular, was uh, incarcerated in a concentration camp, camp during World War II. So think about Black women also as protagonists in that story of French resistance. And then the sort of the second tier, the first image there's André Blouin that I've spoken about a, bit, a little bit. Next to her is Awaketa that I also um, invoked. And then next to her is Eslanda Robeson um, that I mentioned as well. So these are sort of the, the seven women who anchor the book. There are many others who kind of make uh, make brief appearances. Um, and you know, so I think that this is a story that really needs to be developed because there were so many more women at the forefront than a kind of a, a masculine dominated history would, would suggest or allow us to recognize. So thank you so much for, for that question. Thank you. So one of the things, I mean, of course, you're a very, you're a brilliant writer, and and one of the things that uh, you know draws a reader to your book is, is your prologue, in which you begin by speaking about your own uh, receiving of your French citizenship and the whole range of things that came within that process. And as I was reading that, and then the, the book developed, one of the things that I wanted to ask is, why did this book choose you? What is it that drew you to this particular uh, project? That is that. That's a, a really fascinating question because I don't think I've ever been asked this question in this way, right? Why the book chose me? Um, I, I I guess I always kind of trace the genealogy of this book to sort of the the, the kind of intellectual introduction to the negritude movement as that one of those masculine dominated both literary and political movements, right? And so we think about we think about these sort of male-centered traditions. And when we when we think negritude, we will immediately invoke, you know, Aimé Césaire, uh, Leopold Senghor, and uh, Leon Gautran Damas. Um, and then, you know, more recent work like T. Denise Chopley Whiting's Negritude Women, among others, have sought to start to, to think about uh, the place of Black women in these histories. Mm -hmm. I began with negritude. And the first question that came to my mind in thinking about someone like Senghor as a poet politician, thinking about Aimé Césaire as a poet politician was, well, where were the women, right? Because my point of departure is always that they certainly were not absent or silent. Um, and so that that sort of initial question uh, was, was how the, the sort of the quest began to think beyond where were the women was what were they doing, what were they saying? And most importantly, and more crucially for me, is how does hearing and seeing them allow us to to think differently 
about how we understand negritude's claim to blackness, about how we understand France's narrative of citizenship, about how we understand our world, right? And so, you know, being located at, at the sort of the intersection of multiple kinds of oppression as black women in colonized territory, right? We see that play out with André Blouin so, so, um, so, so terribly, but so clearly, um, you know, allows us to understand an even, I think, an even more expansive way to stretch the concept of citizenship beyond what the colonial state can bear as a way of unraveling those, those restrictions. Thank you. So picking up on the point of silencing erasure, the question of where the women, one of the things that we often come against, particularly if we're thinking about anti-colonial work, or even slightly before that, you know, at least in the African context, where which I'm much more familiar with, is the question of archives and narratives. And one of the things that struck me about your book is, is the methodological approach. So there are two things. One is that you had to spend a lot of time in the archives in France to find some of this material. So there's that, there's that thing that I want you to talk about in relation to where our stories lie. Um, and the second is how you worked methodologically to, to piece together. It was almost like you were doing a bit of scavenging and patchwork and, and putting texts together to, to form this expansive and larger narrative. So I'm really interested for you to speak a little bit about your methodology, because I think it offers an opportunity for all of us to think about the kind of work that we want to do, which we, we sort of stop ourselves from doing because we think that we do not have enough material to work with. Uh, and yet the multiple ways in which we could develop work uh, to different kinds of methods. So speak a little bit about the archives and um, the methodology. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the archives, the archives were so tricky, right? They're they so, so tricky to navigate because it, 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 it comes back again to, right, those stories that we tell ourselves, it comes back to what passport you hold that allows you to, you know, enter which country, um, you know, that allows you to then have access to archives. And, and so the, the, the fact that so many of these stories and, and archives are located in France, right, and are located in, in state institutions. So, you know, I'm not just, I'm not talking about like university archives or that kind of thing, right, which I'm, I think I'm more used to in the, in the U.S. context, but, you know, to, to access Jean Vial and Ebuitel stuff, you have to literally walk into the French Senate, right, like, and, and go to the French Senate archives, right, those state institutions. Um, the rest of Ebuitel's files are contained in the Charles de Gaulle Institute, um, and so, you know, that her, her archives are a subset of her husband's archives, which are themselves a subset of Charles de Gaulle's archives, right, in Paris. And so to think about the way that these state institutions are going to order knowledge, right, mm -hmm. how these state institutions are going to order, where is the center, like what's the central node within this archive, and who's on the periphery, right. Um, and so, you know, all, all of those things are, are questions that, that were so central in, in kind of navigating um, archival access is that I, I had to I had to try to think really broadly about where to find the women because that always looked different than you know sort of what the, the state institutional catalog is going to give me as where they might be. So for example, Suzanne Césaire does not exist really right beyond the seven essays that she published. You sort of have to suss out her writings from for example, an archive in Paris has a lot of Aimé Césaire letters. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading those letters, I realized that there were two different handwritings on the page mm -hmm. and that some of that handwriting was his wife, right? That, and she would sign it. And so Suzanne said, like, you have to literally be in a man's archive and in the space of a man's, right, sort of textual production in order to find traces of, of, of his wife's hand. Um, and so, and so that's, that's one of the the, I guess the, the things to, to think about in terms of, you know, where these stories are located. Um, there are also questions of, of for, for Jeanne Vial, for example, because she was in a concentration camp, the record of her trial for her, her role as a clandestine agent in the French resistance, um, that record is sealed and you have to sort of petition the French Minister of Culture, interestingly, right, in order for, for that record to be opened. And you, you, it goes through multiple steps and then you get a letter saying that you have limited access to these documents and you can not use them to tarnish the image of the French state, which I cannot promise that I have I have lived up to that to that legal stipulation, but here we are, right? But again, think about what it means to you know to have to petition a, a, a government body 
in order to obtain access to, to the life and, and trial of, of an African woman, right? So, so there, there are all these things that to navigate. Um, I'm seeing a question about methodology in the chat. So I'm gonna try to box that in with your question that we know about the sort of the patchwork methodology. Um, I don't think I've ever given a talk where I have not said that I'm not a historian, right? Like because the book has received such overwhelming and positive support from historians, um, for which I'm, I'm so so grateful, right? And I, I wonder a lot about my my legibility in my own field because I'm 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 trained as as a literary scholar, right? I like I said I wanted to just come here and talk about poetry, and yet France keeps giving me material, right? And so, but that literary training. It infuses a lot of how I read, right? It infuses the patchwork methodology, um, right? Is that in my mind, I am, I am putting narratives together to try to understand always how language is used to create meaning, right? That's, that's, that's the central sort of framework that I come with as a literary person. Mm -hmm. And so that I think, you know, kind of, uh, uh, that, that accounts for some of the, the, the patchwork methodology. And it's also a question of necessity, right? Because like I said, Suzanne Cezelle's private letters, you kind of have to source them from a lot of different places, but you cannot leave them on the table. Mm -hmm. I could write a book today about Aimé Cezelle. I could write a book today about Notebook of a Return to Native Land alone, right? That one Aimé Cezelle poem. But with Suzanne Cezelle, it's just those seven short essays she wrote. And so you can't leave anything on the table. And so the published writing has to sit alongside, the private letters have to sit alongside, right? The, the narratives and the memories and the, the interviews, they, they all have to kind of come together in this kind of quilt-like pattern in order to, to really flesh out, right? Not just her life, but her, her intellectual trajectory because you cannot trace it over multiple published works. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of, you know, Victoria's question about applying that methodology to groups, to other groups of marginalized women in colonial context. Um, I mean, I, I cannot quite speak to what the archives look like for Southeast Asia, but I suspect that, you know, that's not only possible, but but might be a necessity, right? That, that the methodology emerges organically from the state of the archives, that it emerges organically, not only from what the archives allow in their limitations, but also what they foreclose and prevent. Right. And so there are certain kinds of stories I cannot tell about Suzanne Cesaire, but this patchwork kind of quilting way is one that I can. And I suspect that, you know, for the specific archives that most folks are working with, that the both the, the possibilities and the limits of those archives will ultimately shape the kind of methodology that emerges for a project. Great. Let's stick with Suzanne Cesaire for a minute. And, and that was a particular a chapter that intrigued me, um, partly because of this intertextual thing that you're talking about, where a mayor reports about certain things and then remembers that, oh, I was with Suzanne and adds it into the text, or, you know, the ways in which it speaks about her illness and, and all of these dynamics. And there's, there's a Kenyan scholar who writes about political widowhood, and she's looking at, you know, the wife of um, uh, the first, uh, the second Kenyan president, uh, Moi, and his wife, Lena Moi, who was sort of very invisible in the public domain. Yet, when you look back into the archives, you find her doing all kinds of things. But she became a political widow, right? Uh, or looking at Makuma Alo, who was Jacob Zuma's uh, first wife. And I, I, when I was reading about Suzanne through your work, that was the thing that struck me, the ways in which women are present, but they're almost absent at the same time, and, and how they have to work consistently to recuperate their own agency, even in moments where that particular union was hailed as, as being something uh, significant and useful, for, both for the French empire and, and also for themselves. If you could just speak a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, th that concept of political widowhood is, is so, so intriguing. Um, Right, because it, it applies, I think, in different ways to the different women here. So Suzanne Césaire dies of a brain tumor. She dies, you know, much, much, much uh, earlier than her husband dies. And so that Amy Césaire has a sort of long, expansive legacy, right? He died in 2008. Um, and, and, and so the, in, in, in her case, right, her, her absence is, is occasioned also by, right, her, her, her quite literal absence, right, from from, from passing so soon. Whereas someone like uh, Ibuetel is going to be more quintessentially the political widow because she becomes the first black woman in the French parliament and is kind of tapped to run for that position because of the sort of monumental, right? Immediate national memory of her husband who, you know, is kind of on record as being, you know, the first um, kind of French 
uh, public official to respond yes to Charles de Gaulle's international call for, for, for rallying right, people to the French resistance. But in, in any case, right, regardless of whether their, their husbands, you know, were lived live longer than them, you know, outlived them or not, you have that overshadowing that happens, right? There's always that overshadowing that happens. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example from Ebuitel because it's a fascinating moment in the biography of her husband, Felix Ebui, where the biographer devotes a few lines to her and says, you know, well, she accompanied her husband to his post in um in in uh in chad where she just sort of sat around and he says specifically right he said she sat around grew fat got measured for a bunch of new clothes um there was a hat that was named after her and then that was it right like she disappears from the biography and i thought what a fascinating way to 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 think to to focus on her body right that the particular the, the terms on which she focused on her body as kind of right as a sort of like this kind of like excessive presence that is nevertheless really trivial and useless, right? Because all it's doing is lending its 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 name to a hat that becomes very unpopular very quickly, and nobody even likes the, the Eugenie hat anyway, right? And so I kind of go into think about Eugenie if we tell us like, oh boy, I'm gonna have to try to like really put some flesh on the bones of what I imagine will be a scanty archive about her work as a public person, and I get to her archive and I'm drowning. And just the sheer, right, the, the, the letters, the, 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 the bills and resolutions that she's pushing forward in the parliament, in the French Senate. And I'm thinking, what a way to erase someone who was the, black, the first Black woman parliamentarian and then senator in France, right, as someone who's like completely insignificant in this way, in particularly gendered terms, right? Um, and so, you know, that, that overshadowing always happens and, and demands always a different set of lens for kind of recuperating, right? I began with recuperation as my goal, but I realized that that meant that that biographer was setting the terms on which I would engage with Abu Tail. And so I had to kind of quickly try to move beyond recuperation and to think more broadly about, about contribution and presence um, in ways that were not kind of beholden to the erasures, right? That had that had occasioned their absence. I have another question, but there's a question here in the chat, which is around: Can you briefly flesh out the code noir? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh gosh. Okay. So uh, a, a kind of a, a brief overview of Francis racial license in two minutes and go. Okay. So the the code noir essentially, um, right? The during during at some, at some point um you know during during the slave trade um and in france's kind of uh inst institutionalizing of slavery in its colonies um right particularly its uh, new world colonies right so the caribbean and the americas um france is going to promulgate uh the black codes um right so the the code noir is essentially this this document um that sets out the the the, the laws if you will um to, to govern the practice of slave holding. And so for example, um, you know, how, how many times an enslaved person has to run away in order for you to whip them or, you know, so after the first, the first flight, you know, they get X number of lashes. After the, the, the third flight, you know, you, you, you cut the, the tendon in the foot, right? So like it was, it was, it was gruesome and brutal, but it was, it was legally enshrined. And the goal was to temper the excess of violence, right? By slaveholders. So, you know, if, if all of the horrible things that are laid out in the Kudma appear terrible to us, today, um, they are apparently, you know, supposedly um, quite measured compared to just the kind of the, the excess of violence that um, slaveholders were, were meeting out to, to um, enslaved people in the colonies. And so it governs sort of every aspect of the lives of enslaved people, including, you know, like what to do on Sundays, you know, who, who and when and how a person can be baptized, right? Every element of their, their spiritual, physical, you know, existence um, in the colonies on the plantation. So that's, that's the code noir. Um, the degree to which it was applied was very spotty. But again, it comes back to challenge the idea that France never codified racism the way that the United States did, right? Because the code noir is one example of that. Um, um, the police de noir, the um, yeah, the police de noir is another of those laws and codes that showed France's codification of race and racism um, in its laws. And so the, the police de noir um, in 1780, 1780s um, essentially was to prohibit um, or to regulate the entry 
of enslaved people into metropolitan France because France had the free soil principle, right? That anyone who touches French soil is free. And so then in order to continue to prevent, right? People from, you know, attaining that freedom was to regulate how and when enslaved people could enter the colonies um, and to prohibit essentially the entry. So that's the Code Noir, that's the police de Noir. And then the post-war massacre, um, I mean, Ousmane Semben's film, uh, Comte de Tiaroy, I'm gonna put that in the, uh, in the chat, it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, you know, kind of creative, fictional, but also historical treatment of the of the Tiaroy massacre. Um, and there are also a number of monographs that that uh, kind of discuss it, right? But essentially, demobilized African soldiers who had come back um, to, from from World War Two, right? So they were in Tiaroy, sort of waiting to be kind of dispatched to their their home locations wherever they came from. Um, you know, thank you for your service, etc. Um, you know, we're not receiving the pen right as 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 demobilized soldiers that they had been promised when they went to fight right so the fiction that colonial soldiers went to fight to liberate France because they cherished the motherland right and believed in liberty culture fraternity right it's kind of laid bare by the demand well you also told us that we, we were going to you know uh, receive these pensions um and so they you know they kind of uh, had a had a went on strike essentially um a, a protest um to demand their pensions and were were, were shot and killed right they, they were massacred um uh by by the the french army um on the orders of the colonial administration right in 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 um in senegal and so so that that's that's the the Tiaroy massacre um up until I want to say about four or five years ago, uh, veterans of World War II, right, African veterans of World War II were still petitioning France for those, those pensions, by the way, like France really never ever made good on that promise to recognize, right, in whatever paltry way that it could monetarily, to recognize the sacrifice of African soldiers who went to, you know, heeded the call to come and liberate France um, from Europe's own Nazi you know, Nazism turn turn on itself. So, so that's that's the that's the the Tiawai massacre. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about our cater. Um, mm -hmm. And one uh, provocation for you is that there are, you make an argument. First of all, this is uh, in in the seven women. This is one of the women who had actually written her own her own you know autobiography, if you will. Um, you make the argument that perhaps the, one of the reasons why how her material and her work, you know, sort of goes out of circulation is because of the limited attention she gives to the personal and the focus on the political. Um, I question that. <laughs> and I'm asking whether there's a lot more going on there. So, so for instance, you know, if I think about our caters, our cater as a person, I would think of her alongside maybe somebody like say Winnie Mandela, right? Uh, in the sense of the political work that she was doing in communities and mobilizing uh, women and other communities around a set of particular political ideals. What distinguishes these two people is the fact that one was uh, tethered um, to a, a well-known you know, political prisoner uh, and fought over time to distinguish herself, of course, as, as, as a political actor, uh, as, you know, in her own right, as opposed to one that is connected to Nelson Mandela. Well, our cater is not. So is there something else that is still gendered, but is not necessarily connected to her refusal to appeal to the, you know, mother of the nation uh, narrative that makes her, her, her history and her work not captured or known in, in the ways in which others would for instance yeah that's that's a really interesting question um and i i, I mean I, I agree with you completely right it's so so i'll say this i don't i don't know that keita herself refuses the mother of the nation kind of right i i i'm refusing that that for her or i'm questioning the utility or the limits of describing keita as a mother of the nation so you know it, it, because in some ways keita is hailed wherever she goes as the mother of the nation, because as a midwife, she quite literally, right, sort of um, uh, facilitated the, the birth and delivery of a lot of, right, she, by her count, thousands of children in, in, in Mali. Um, and so, and so by, by, by her count, right, that she is in some ways the, the mother of the nation. Um, what happens is that in the, the few moments where she is then read in scholarship, 
she is read solely or primarily through that lens. And, you know, kind of think about the work of, of Amina Mama, for example, what it means to, to always route African women's po political activism through the lens of giving birth to the nation, right? Through the lens of mothering the nation. Um, and so you know, that's kind of what I was, I was trying to push back on to say, well, Keita herself, even if she is hailed as mother of nation wherever she goes, she sees that primarily through the lens of, this is my work, my professional work as a midwife. Right, um, and she herself avoids so much of the personal. Now, I agree with you in the sense that, unlike Winnie Mandela, unlike I think I'm looking at my 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 board, my image of, of the seven women here. I think Keita is the only one. Keita and Viala are the only ones who don't have the famous man hook. Right, like I had a famous husband, or you know, I worked with Patrice Lumumba, or you know, whatever. Right, she doesn't have the famous man hook. And so you're absolutely right that that's part of you know why people tend to bypass her, right? Because she. You, you won't encounter her if you're coming at this from the sort of traditional route of like, these are the, the primary figures of African liberation. And then, oh, these are the women who are sort of adjacent to them. If, if that's the path, then you won't really encounter Keita much, um, right? So, so that's part of what, what leads to the elision. But I also do think that her avoiding, she talks about the personal in like 10 pages out of a 400 page autobiography, right? Like her whole life from birth to her, you know, her childhood, education, marriage, divorce, 10 pages, the beginning, bam. And then the rest of the 390 pages, right? So to some degree, she'll talk about like one election. She'll just go like blow by blow, right? At 3.15 PM on that election, it is what happened. And then 3.30 and she cataloged, right? So, so much space is devoted to the, the kind of the, the, the public activism. I think there's something to be said for that imbalance and for the way that people who have ultimately studied Keita have always lamented the, 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 the absence of the personal, right? And so, so I do think that that does still play a role because at a particular time of like post-colonial literature, post-colonial theory, et cetera, we didn't quite know how to approach a text by an African woman that was not about her suffering in a domestic space, right? I'm thinking about like the, the quintessential, right? Like Mariam Abbas, you know, so long a letter as, as the kind of like the er text, right? One of the, the texts that at least from a literary perspective as one of the central texts to which we, we come to understand African women's writings, right? Folks like um, Bukie Micheta, Flora Nwapa and others, right? Like this is how we understand African women's writings. And those writings are so, so, so critical, right? So this is not to, um, to belittle them in any way. But it's to say that when you think about a contemporary of these women who doesn't do that at all, right? And has this huge 400 page text that tells you about these colonial administrators and how she like, you know, sh shot a gun in the air because they wanted to chase her out of town, right? Like there, there wasn't really a methodological framework in at least a particular strand of scholarship mm -hmm. for how to think about her. And I think that that really did kind of move attention away from her work to the degree that it kind of fell out of out of readership and then out of print. But yeah. I absolutely agree with you, right? There are so many more factors, yeah. um, including, you know, the lack of the famous manhood for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Andre uh, Blumois, who I, I discovered recently, of course, because everyone was, uh, you know, talking about uh, Patrice Lumumba, his anniversary, and it's great that you actually wrote that article in Al Jazeera, uh, just to remind many of us who invoke that famous speech about who was behind that speech. But you also, and one of the things that I like that you do in the book, you're very clear that, you know, th there's an expansion and a reimagining of citizenship that is happening. Uh, through these seven women, but there are also limits to which that happens, right? And I think uh, and Andre's story is a, is a specific one, just given the sort of mixed race heritage and how she plays into that at different moments. Um, could you could you just spend a little time exploring this Matisse dynamic and 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 how she mobilizes that, leverages it or not, in the ways in which she imagines what Pan Africanism could look like? Yeah. Ooh, that was that was that was a, a tough a tough kind of thing to to wrap my mind around in the book, right? So you know, in in, in much the same way as Kate's focus on the public to the detriment, if you will, maybe of of the to, of, of the personal, you know, makes her her text this the strange book that I don't we I, we initially don't quite know what to do with, right? Andre Blouin's autobiography is is similar in the sense that well, 
you know, I myself began my talk talking a lot about Black women, right? And Bluan doesn't really identify that way. She identifies as mixed race because she is identified as mixed race, right? So the question is, what do you do with an African nationalist, a pan-Africanist who doesn't quite identify as Black, um, right? Is that you have to grapple with race in ways that we, one of the fictions we tell ourselves, I think on the African continent is that, you know, we we, we never thought about race. Like people say this all the time, right? I never thought about race until I went to America or until I went to the UK and I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> race is still very present, you know, even on the continent, even if we appear to be, right, the, the, the majority, if you will. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and it might be different, like, you know, Southern Africa, but certainly in West Africa, we think we like to, to tell that fiction a lot. A lot. Um, so to think about, about Blue as mixed race um, meant thinking about racial construction on the African continent and how we engaged in those constructions at the specific moment of decolonization or let me say independence, right? Decolonization ongoing, independence happened. Um, so, you know, in, in, in that moment, there was a lot of kind of subsuming racial difference, even gender difference, right? Um, as, as kind of like minor things to think about, but, you know, to be subsumed under the larger, more critical project of, you know, independence now. And so that we cannot think about race because that's dividing us. We cannot focus on gender differences beyond mobilizing gender in these politicized narratives of mother of the nation, et cetera, because that's dividing us, right? Um, Bluant is going to say and show and argue that you have to think about race because the construction of race was part of the construction of the colony and that unraveling those colonial constructions will have to grapple with race if independence is going to be meaningful in any way, right? And so that's at least that's the lesson that I take away from what it means to think about a woman who identifies as mixed race and as a Pan-Africanist and who's constantly navigating her relationship to her white French father and her black African mother, right? And I'm already, I was already troubled by those terms, right? That, that sort of situate whiteness in this specific like national frame of France and then blackness of this continental thing, right, of an African mother. Blue Eye repurposes those colonial categories a lot um, in ways that are certainly troubling, um, but also, also that end up kind of showing the fiction behind the separation of races, right? And so remember the question that she asked in that painful moment that I read in the introduction, when she says, why would white people be so cruel to a child that is three fourths white? There's a racial calculation that's happening there that shows the way that France's kind of obsession with racial categorization or the colonial powers obsession with racial categorization is going to end up influencing and shaping how Blue herself sees herself, how she sees her son and their, their rights to accessing different degrees of French citizenship sort of protections, um, you know, access to healthcare, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, there, there's so much I think to be said about, about this, this métissage question. In the book, I show how folks like Leopold Senghor, for example, make these sort of clumsy attempts at, at thinking about or sweeping under the, under the rug, um, this idea of being mixed race by saying, oh, we're all African and we all belong to, you know, the black race and doesn't matter, et cetera. And in certain ways, of course, right, race, race is a, it's a social construct, um, right, but there, there's nothing mere about a social construct and that it, it marked Blue One's life, her body, et cetera. Um, I'll give one really, really quick and final example is the fact that she grows up in an orphanage. Her two parents are alive, but if you are mixed race in the French colonies and in the Belgian colonies, you had to grow up in an orphanage because it was unbearable for the colonial administration to allow the evidence of interracial mixing to be there, right? It would belie, again, the fiction that, you know, white, whiteness is superior to blackness, et cetera, right? That that intimate mixing there becomes really troubling for that separation. Belgium a few years ago apologized very awkwardly in its parliament, right, as the descendants of mixed race Belgians were sitting in the in the wings of the Belgian parliament, um, you know, apologized for for kind of shunting children off into these violent and abusive orphanages. France does what France does, right? If we don't see it, then it never happened. So, you know, people are still waiting even for that minor acknowledgement of, of a terrible thing that happened. Um, but but those, those spaces of segregation, right, where mixed race children grew up away from their families, um, usually under the tutelage of, of Catholic nuns, um, are spaces of violence that, that um, that, that attest again to the racialized forms of, of segregation that we might um, 
uh, attribute to other parts, other kinds of colonial settlements, but were certainly the case even in administrative colonies um, like France's colonies in West and Central Africa. Thank you, and, and you're bound to find the Catholics everywhere now. Uh, yes. <laughs> I was also going to say that I, I am amongst those group of people who argued that until I went to a certain place, I had no um, very visceral uh, experiences of, of racism. And that was, you know, spending time in South Africa and, and being reminded that, oh, OK. Um, so the, the, I think you're right. Race is always there. It's, it's, it's the ways in which we experience it in a majority black world that looks different. Uh, and it's not to argue that it's, it's, it's non-existent. Um, I want to return uh, to where you started off, which is, is citizenship is a fiction, the current uh, events that are happening in France and the, the work that is being done by Afro, uh, um, you know, Afro-European, you know, uh, movements, Afro-feminist movements across Europe. Uh, and as I offer this final question from my end, I want to invite any more questions from the audience as well. Otherwise we will slowly come to a close. If we look at the seven women and you're making uh, strong political arguments around what they do to uh, what they push us to think about in relation to the bounds of the nation state, what they do in relation to pushing us to think about what black uh, nationalism, black solidarity, black consciousness look like in the, in the, in the, in the ways in which they mobilize uh, and engage with, with the French empire. And if we turn uh, to, to this particular moment that we all find ourselves in globally, uh, of course, cultivated and, and sort of catalyzed very powerfully, you know, through the movement for Black Lives in the summer of, of 2020, uh, that then sort of forced us globally to have some serious conversations that, that we've been having in very sort of scattered ways in, in different parts of the Black world. What would you argue are the lessons, if you will, that feminists of today should take or can think with in connection to this women's work? Recognizing the limits of the, the, the radicalness, of course, but, but there's something there. That's why this book was produced. There's something there that you're trying to say uh, that's not just about here, there, the way, uh, I'm, I'm trying to show you that women existed. That's not what you're trying to do. So is there stuff that we can learn as feminists who are mobilizing at this particular moment around, uh, at the nexus of racial justice and, and, and gender freedom that we can draw from these seven women and others that you know, are lying in the archive somewhere? That, that is, that is a, an incredible question. Um, and I'm kind of looking at my notes and, and trying to figure out what to, what, to, what to possibly distill because, because part of what was interesting for me in the book was the range of visions, right? That these women all had um, from, you know, from, from ardently communist to, you know, more, more conservative leaning, um, you know, from believing in independence to believing in a French union to believing in the French overseas departmentalization, right? That their, their visions were so different um, that the value for me was to understand how to, how to think expansively about black women's activism, regardless of, of how effective or not, regardless of how closely or not they ally to my, to my own thinking. So, but right, I make the argument, like, like you're saying in the book, that there is something that unifies all of them, right? And, and that's something would be ideally, right? That 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 lesson I think that we can take away in our present moment. I think sometimes when I'm asked this question, the answer changes depending on when I'm asked. But ultimately at the heart of it for me was about it's going to sound so basic, but who controls the narrative, right? Because regardless of ultimately the differences in their visions, these women refused to cede ground in any of the domains that they had identified as crucial. From literature, to language teaching, to writing an autobiography, to voting, to electoral politics, right? To all of it, um, to intimate relationships, right? Within or across racial lines, et cetera. The question for them ultimately was, what it meant to refuse French state constructions or even limiting, right, uh, sort of post independent national narratives by understanding the ways that those narratives about citizenship, freedom, and belonging continue to be tied to a colonial foundation, right? And I think that that's 
that's one of the that that's one of the lessons that that we can carry with us in the present moment is when we are faced with what appear to be convincing arguments about the impossibility of abolishing policing for example or about the necessity of surveillance or punitive right kind of military um uh, interventions beyond borders and within our own borders as the necessary price that we pay for national security, right? That at each time we are faced with these narratives, these fictions, right, is to understand the colonial roots, the imperial roots of those narratives in order to articulate a response that is life-giving and not death-dealing. Suzanne Césaire, in the midst of the bombardment of World War II, who writes in a letter that she sees constantly in her mind, she replaced images of war, right? When I think about her in our present moment, where we are confronted constantly with constant images on a loop of black people being killed at the hands of police, that we must be presented with that video evidence constantly for people to believe that this is happening, right? That Suzanne Cedia refused that death dealing as the point of departure for understanding political activism that for her, it had to be grounded in understanding of the possibility of Black life. And I think that that's what groups like Moisi in France are doing. I think that that's what Asa Traoué is doing in her demands for, right, for justice for her brother's death. Because certainly, she talks constantly, right, and, 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 and engages constantly with the fact and the realities of his death. But I intended a talk that she gave recently where she said a striking sentence. She said, nobody ever came to my mother and asked her, Madame Tawi, what do you like to do in your free time? And I was astounded. I said, but we're here to talk about, you know, the death and the killing and the autopsies and et cetera, et cetera. And she wanted to think about her mother's quotidian access to joy and leisure, right? In the face of all of that, as one of the starting points for imagining, right, her response, her counter to the death dealing of the colonial French state. That for me, I think is a powerful lesson to continue to carry with us now. Um, is what does it mean to focus on the possibilities of black life? Wow, that's powerful. And I think it has catalyzed some more questions. So this first one from Julia, um, if you could please comment on the critical race theory and how it's currently being interpreted on US campuses. Then the second one is from Wangari. And let me just scroll down if I can. What are your thoughts about Francophone, about how Francophone Africa and Africans currently interact with France and the French state and vice versa? This is in relation to citizenship, language, culture, monetary arrangements, etc. Okay. Um, ooh, do I want to touch that one? Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, Francophone folks always tell us Francophone folks, so you don't really understand, you know, how we relate to France, etc. But okay, I will I will try to wade into those very tricky waters. Um, but I'll start with with Julia's question about about critical race theory. Um, the, the way that critical race theory is sort of being marshaled in public, right, because you, you evoke the article, Julia, um, is being marshaled in the media, right, is, is as a kind of a catch-all term. Um, in the same way that the martial identity politics as a catch-all term for anything that is distasteful because it emphasizes or highlights Blackness in ways that um, a dominant majority would ideally not want to confront. But identity politics is a term that was first used and defined in the 1970s, right, by, by the Black feminists, right, Combahee River Collective. But when it is marshaled on, on Fox News, they most certainly have not read the Combahee River Collective statement, right? But identity politics kind of thrown around. And, and critical race theory is, is, is the same thing is happening now. It's happening in France, it's happening in the US, um, it's happening, you know, in, in recent, you know, sort of state policies in both places to kind of like tamp down on, um, you know, any, any kind of state or federal support for research programs, etc. that employ critical race theory, right? So it's a kind of the, in, 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 in a kind of a, an, an opposite effect of what happens when MLK is sanitized right here, right? The, the, the theory is taken, demonized, if infused with a particular kind of definition and then trotted out as the, the, the boogeyman, right? As the ill to be countered, which is a really classic tool, I think of misdirection, 
Why talk about the fact that Black people in France are 20 times more likely to stop by police if you can talk about critical race theory being imported by America as a way to challenge, right, to, to destroy what it means to be French? Right, that there is something that we can all supposedly as French people can all rally around. We don't, none of us want Frenchness to be destroyed, certainly, right? Although, okay, so let me and let me end that statement there, unless I get myself into trouble. But but so all, all of that to say, right, to, to, to in terms of my views about critical race theory and how it's currently being interpreted, um, I think that its interpretation in the media is quite different from its its application and use in intellectual spaces, right? Particularly in the field of black studies, um, like black studies and, and education, so where, where it kind of originates, uh, right? But in the field of black studies as a, as a crucial framework for thinking about the ways that the constructions of race and the structures of racism continue to order our lives, right? That's that, right? So, so I think that there's that kind of disconnect that's happening there. Um, we can try to kind of like lob it back into the media and say this is the actual definition, but my suspicion is I don't know to what degree that's going to be effective, right? So that's that's sort of where we are. Um, the question about how Francophone Africa and Africans currently interact with France and the French state. Okay, let's do this. Um, I mean, it's, it's a really important question, right? Because it, it's a question that speaks to the longevity of those colonial ties. Um, that the nature of that continued interaction, right? The way that um, Wangari, you're asking here about the, the CFA, the CFA, for example, right? The, the longevity of those those ties speaks to the nature of French colonialism and the fictions of French colonialism, right? As a civilizing mission, right? So France's dominant narrative, right? What, what, I, what I, I talk about in the book, um, you know, building on the work of François Vergès as the French colonial gift. Right, that, that France makes this gift of civilization um, to, to Africans, right? That gift of civilization is, is its language, its philosophy, its history, et cetera. And that all you have to do is assimilate well enough to deserve and attain those gifts, right? Um, that colonial, that founding colonial fiction continues to order um, the, the relationship between, I think, France's former colonies um, and, and the metropole. Uh, the, 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 the British didn't quite engage in, in that level of subterfuge to, to that degree, at least. They were, they, so their bare knuckle tactics were a little bit different, uh, but, but France really was convincing, right, in its, in its, in its camouflage about, about the, the gift of civilization to be bestowed on Africans. And so for someone like Senghor, right, even when, when that fiction is quite clear to him as a fiction, it's still going to be so very indebted to a kind of a French education, right, that, that you're going to see traces of that in terms of the, the, the philosophers that he engages with, for example, as his starting point. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's just, that's just uh, maybe what what is what the, the initial things I'd say about that right is is that the present is 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 continued evidence of the nature of the foundational narrative of French colonialism, which was so very much about this this supposedly civilizing mission. And shout out to to Antia Kosia who has to leave us soon. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Annette, uh, for this very rich discussion and a book that I really enjoyed reading. Might I invite you as we close to read us a, a short ex excerpt from your book and, and then we can wrap up? Oh, goodness. OK. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, OK, let's see where is, is there a particular portion of the book that you found particular or the person that you found evocative? Um, I found you. I, I really enjoyed the prologue and I wondered whether you might return there. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, the, the, the prologue is, I guess, my, my, my attempt to do what I, what I said when I read the, 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 the passage from the, the first pages, right? That blue screams were not a spectacle. Mm -hmm. That for me as, as a writer, I wanted to not approach this work from the safe distance of my present, mm -hmm. um, but to think about my own implication, personal, political, and otherwise in this, in this work. Um, and so the, the prologue is essentially this. I became a French citizen in 2017 as I was writing this book. There was no pomp and circumstance, no singing of the Marseillaise in a tearful ceremony attended by joyful relatives eager to welcome me into the folds of France. None of my relatives are French. Mm 
The plain white envelope that arrived in the mail from the French consulate contained a red, white, and blue folder bearing the image of Marianne swinging the tricolore, an image taken from Eugène Delacroix's famous 19th century painting, Liberty Leading the People. Inside the folder, the form letter bearing Francois Hollande's signature announced my, quote, attachment to the long history of a France that over centuries has welcomed women and men who have recognized themselves in its values, liberty, equality, fraternity, secularism, end quote. The well-known tripartite motto of liberty, equality, fraternity that began as the rallying cry of the French Revolution sported a new addition in this repackaging of national values for an age when secularism was no longer brandished in the face of the Catholic clergy with as much conviction as in the revolutionary era. And when Islam now constituted a key site of contestation over who could really be French. The rest of the folder's contents illuminated the government's view on the necessary ingredients for becoming a good French citizen. The official scores of the mandatory language exam proved that I knew enough French to be French. Glossy A4 sheets printed with the words to the Marseillaise, finally, the constitution of the French Fifth Republic and the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen were testaments to the specific elements of French history that I could now apparently claim as mine. This last document, Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, would be a useful point of departure for my analysis of citizenship in this book. Of the plethora of administrative documents that came with my acquisition of French citizenship, two in particular stood out as emblematic of the comfort and discomfiture that this new status brought. The first was a brochure informing me that if I had not responded to the consulate's initial offer regarding the gallicization of my name, it was not too late to do so. Now, anyone who has been through a French administrative process will be struck, as I was, by the rarity of second chances. An entire dossier could be unceremoniously thrown out or at best returned to the applicant over a typo. To offer a second chance at modifying the spelling of my name then is to underscore a need to render legible to the French state those names identities and cells deemed illegible. The second document was a French consulate registration card issued in Chicago as proof that I had now been placed under consulate protection. This was a year when unstable leaders who will remain unnamed in the United States and North Korea goaded each other with barbs about their physical appearances, mental capacities, and nuclear arsenals. The consulate's language of protection, dubious as its efficacy may be, provided an illusion of safer alternatives to a grim reality. This was, however, also the year that the French government fired the high profile feminist activist, anti racist activist, Rokaya Diallo from the National Digital Council over her use of the term state racism to publicly contest institutionalized racism in France. The promises of rights and protections, the administrative reminders to rebaptize myself for legibility, and the realities of Black women's ongoing and unfulfilled demands for equality in France all come together in the terms on which I engage with citizenship in this book. Citizenship, as my French naturalization folder attests, is the individual's relationship to the state. It unfolds in the legal arena of constitutions and laws, rights and duties. 
the linguistic and visual images in the folder show that citizenship also unfolds in the social, cultural, and political spheres of community building, identity formation, and belonging. It is concrete and abstract. What follows in this book is an examination of the different ways that the concrete and abstract came together and pulled apart as Black women demanded full citizenship in the mid 20th century at a particularly pivotal period in French history. In the text that formed the core of this project archive, we find a different set of ingredients for good citizenship. We hear a remix of the Marseillaise that calls on Guadeloupians to make their political voice heard by voting for Eugenie Ebuitel to become the first Black woman deputy in the French National Assembly. We see the tricolor, but in the hands of Awaketa, a community organizer in rural Mali, as she stitches the letters RDA onto the French flag to represent the Rassemblement Démocratique Africain, a West Africa-wide anti-colonial political party. These different texts go beyond simply showing that Black women too can be French citizens. They prod us instead to rethink the relationship between race, gender, belonging, and political agency. They show us again and again that to demand full citizenship as a Black woman is to unmake and remake the French Republic. It is to redefine the very nature of civic participation and national identity in a country that both sees itself as white and claims to be colorblind. It is also to imagine citizenship beyond the borders of Imperial France and to reclaim multiple forms of belonging that take into account the varied spaces that Black women have historically claimed and continue to claim as theirs. Thank you very, very much, Annette. And once again, I want to thank you for taking this opportunity to come and spend time with us to talk about your amazing book project. I really encourage everyone to, to look for the book. It's um, fairly affordable. Um, and uh, buy it, read it, because this work by Black women and Black, Black scholars, if we don't engage this material, uh, it serves no great purpose to our own collective work of, of looking for greater freedom and justice for ourselves in the world. Read it, cite it, engage with it, pass it on to your family and friends too. And to those who showed up this evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are to spend time with us, asanteni sana sana sana. Be well, go well, and have a good day. Thank you so much. <laughs>